every day 100 people are shot and killed in the United States. And gun violence is a uniquely American problem. That's part of the heartbreak of it. We have a gun homicide rate 25 times higher than that of other high-income countries. Gun violence is clearly a problem in the United States, and it can be a really heartbreaking and overwhelming one. But change is possible, especially when 90% of Americans support common-sense gun laws like universal background checks. But it feels like progress is slow. But as always, we found people who are stepping up to make a huge difference in the fight against gun violence. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Our first guest today is Shannon Watts, the founder of Moms Demand Action. After the Sandy Hook shooting claimed the lives of 28 people, including 20 children, Shannon moved into action to end gun violence. She started Moms Demand Action, a nonpartisan grassroots movement that fights for stronger gun laws in America and encourages responsible gun ownership. I spoke with Shannon about why moms are uniquely poised to make a difference in fighting gun violence, why America has higher rates of gun violence, and why we can be encouraged by incremental change. And she shared simple action steps for getting involved. I also got to talk with activist Crystal Turner, who tragically lost two of her children to gun violence in 2015. Crystal now works with Moms Demand Action as a dedicated and passionate advocate for common sense gun laws. She's also the founder of Mothers in Healing, a grief counseling initiative for mothers who have lost children to gun violence. I spoke with Crystal about how her life has changed since losing her children and how she now helps mothers cope, heal, and find hope. I love this conversation. I'm so glad we got to have it. So let's jump straight into it. I want to go back and kind of just start at the beginning of Mom's Demand, back before it was Mom's Demand. And it sounds like for you, your inciting moments, and I think anybody who, you know, becomes an activist or decides to take action on something has some sort of inciting moment. But your inciting moment, it seems, was the Sandy Hook shooting that took the lives of 20 children between the ages of six and seven years old as well as six adult staff members. And I'd like to begin our conversation there. Can you just take me back to that day in your life and you know what was going through your head? At the time, I was a stay-at-home mom of five uh, in Indianapolis. And my kids were kind of all over the age range from, from elementary to college. And I was folding laundry. And it was uh, December 14th of 2012. And I, I saw on my TV that there was an active shooter in Newtown, Connecticut, a city I'd never heard of. And like everyone else in the country, you know, I was sort of riveted to my television and and just couldn't believe the horrific video footage of, of children and adults streaming out of the school into the woods through the parking lot, looking terrorized. But then over the next few hours already, there were pundits and politicians also on my TV, telling me that that somehow this was because this this tragedy had happened because there weren't enough guns, hmm. and that more guns, like armed teachers, would have somehow prevented this this tragedy, and it just made me so angry. You know, I knew that was not true. I didn't know anything about gun violence or or gun laws or organizing. I, I just knew that that wasn't true. So I, I went online. And I thought, okay, I'm going to join something like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, but for the issue of gun safety. And I couldn't find anything. Um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving had been so pivotal to to me and my generation as a teen in the 80s. So I just assumed that that existed. And and what I found were sort of one-off think tanks run by men, some city and state organizations also run by men. And you know what I have seen create change so often in this country is a badass army of women. And that's what I wanted to be a part of. And so I I started a Facebook page and that online conversation has become the largest offline movement in the country. 
what were those initial posts in that Facebook page like? What was the emotion? What was the energy like? It was very much, uh, you know, uh, and I was running the Facebook page, I actually did for years. And it was, you know, it is time to get off the sidelines. And in particular, I think I was talking to white women <laughs> who, you know, too many of us and shame on us came to this movement because we were afraid our children weren't safe in their schools. But we know that that black and brown women have been doing this work with very little attention for decades. And it was a, a call to action to finally use our voices and our votes on this issue. And also, you know, I think it was, let's, let's march, let's rally. And in retrospect, I think that is makes sense, but it wasn't what we needed to do. What we needed to do, and we, we learned soon thereafter, was to, to organize, just like the NRA had been doing for decades. Maybe you could break that down a little bit more for me because, you know, I, I do see that there's value in, you know, a march or a protest, but you're saying, you know, there's more to it than that. Like, what made you come to that conclusion? Why do you think that it's more effective to go a, a level deeper? You know, a one-off march or a rally or, or even a series of them across the country are fine and they, they drive media attention, but it's a very short-term action. And when, you know, what is often needed is the, what I call the unglamorous heavy la- lifting of grassroots activism. It is hard to organize. <laughs> um, it's painstaking. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. It strips on a rock. You know, when everyone wants wholesale revolutions, which I totally get, it's not how the system is set up. The system is set up for incremental change. And if you don't commit to that incrementalism and accept that that is what leads to revolutions, you won't have any change at all. And so we decided, uh, you know, a couple of months in that we would have to, just like the gun lobby had done, uh, create volunteers in every single city, in every single state, and that we would have to show up at every gun bill hearing and at school board meetings and city council meetings. Um, and, and yes, that we would need to work on this on a federal level too, but that building the momentum sort of started in the communities where we lived. So you start to organize this community of people who are themselves organizing to create change. Tell me about that that growth and that snowball effect because I understand it started off big and then it, it grew to get bigger. What is what is the process of growing a movement like that like? Well I would say it started with social media and we've all heard stories about how you know a, a website or a post or a tweet has gone viral and and just generated a lot of activity. And, and that that was very much what happened in this circumstance. Our, our Facebook page was attracting volunteers, but also gun extremists. And it was something that, that ended up putting me on the front page of USA Today just a few weeks after I started Moms to Me in Action. Um, and so it started online. And then we, you know, I was working on this with perfect strangers all across the country who I just sort of trusted to, to be as passionate about this as I was and, and to bring skill sets I didn't have to the table. And we started a Facebook page for every single state in addition to our main Facebook page. Uh, I had an inactive Twitter handle. And so we started tweeting. And it wasn't too long afterward that we got a call from the White House and they said, in honor of the Sandy Hook school mass shooting, we are going to work to pass something called Mansion to Me. It was a bipartisan bill to close the background check loophole. Right now in this country, you have to have a background check when you buy a gun from a licensed dealer, but not from an unlicensed dealer. And that is, is a loophole that, that has been closed now in 21 states, but not at a federal level. And so when you don't have to buy guns from an unlicensed dealer, that means you can get them at gun shows or uh, online or even at garage sales in some states. So we really put a lot of our, our time and attention toward that vote, which happened in the spring of 2013. And we all thought, oh, yeah, of course this is going to pass. Of course our lawmakers will act after 20 children and six educators were killed in the sanctity of an American elementary school. And I was sitting in the Senate gallery when it failed by six votes, four of those Democratic senators. And it was a pivotal moment because, you know, we could have said, okay, well, 
you know, this, we tried, we failed, the country isn't ready for this. Let's go back to our normal lives. But our volunteers are very sophisticated and brilliant. And, and what they said was, let's pivot and start doing this work in our state houses and in our boardrooms where we live. You know, if you look at marriage equality now, in retrospect, that's exactly what they did, right? They, they worked in their communities knowing the momentum would eventually point the right president and the right Congress in the right direction and the right Supreme Court. Um, and so we, we had some governors in some states who were willing to pass stronger gun laws after the Sandy Hook school shooting. But we also saw some legislatures actually doing the opposite and trying to ram through the NRA's agenda. I never imagined how much time we'd spend playing defense, um, you know, not just offense. And we've, we've done an amazing job, I think, at the state level in passing good gun bills, but stopping bad gun bills. We have a 90 percent track record of stopping the NRA's agenda year after year for the last five years. Wow. Uh, and those were you know, laws that were really just sailing through state houses before moms to be in action. Also doing this work, you know, legislatively, but also electorally. So being a part of every single election cycle. Uh, spending money, endorsing candidates, uh, running our own volunteers and gun violence survivors uh, in this last election cycle. 100 of them ran, 43 won, which is a pretty amazing track record. That's huge. Two of our volunteers are now members of Congress, Lucy McBath and Marie Newman. And then I would say the third leg of the stool is really the cultural work we do. So teaching people about secure gun storage through our Be Smart program. Over a million families have received our materials through schools or pediatricians offices uh and also making sure that that celebrities and influencers and athletes and artists uh are also involved in the movement um and and also companies you know we have we have gotten several hundred companies to change their policies around open carry or gun sales in the last eight and a half years so it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of work but here we are you know, less than a decade later, and we're larger than the NRA. And I don't even know that they have as many members as they pretend to have. So the NRA is weaker than it's ever been. And and our movement is stronger than it's ever been. You decided intentionally to have this be of movement centered around moms. And I would love for you to share, like, what is the superpower behind moms? Like, what is the unique impact that moms bring to the table? And, and, and why was that the missing ingredient in this movement? A couple things. One is, you know, I do think that women are the secret sauce to activism. Mm. And we've seen that again, all the way from prohibition, when women were first allowed to get involved in activism and, and men were never really able to put that toothpaste back in the bottle, uh, all the way to the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. You know, it's really been often women who are on the front lines uh, and and who are forcing change. But the other piece of it is when you look at who makes up the NRA's leadership and membership, when you look at who makes up our, our lawmakers and our business leaders, the vast majority of them are men. Only 20% of the 500,000 elected positions in this country are held by women. Wow. Uh, and we're only about 5% of Fortune 1000 CEOs. So we don't have all of the levers of power available to us to make the laws or the policies that protect our families and our communities. But there are certain levers of power we, we have available to us. One is our, our voice, so being activists. The other is our vote. Uh, women are the majority of the voting electorate. And also our spending power. We make about 80% of the spending decisions for our families. So those are really the levers of power that that we've been pulling. So for me, all of this sounds incredibly common sense. All of these pivots, these changes, uh, the progress that we're making. And it sounds like the polling supports that as well, that, that most Americans agree that there needs to be some common sense gun reform happening in this country. What would you say to somebody who thinks that you want to take their guns? It's really important to understand that we are not anti-gun. We are anti-gun violence. Many mm. of our volunteers are gun owners or their partners are gun owners. There are nearly 400 million guns in this country, 50 million sold in the last year alone. This is not about undoing the Second Amendment or taking away people's weapons. Um, this is simply about restoring the responsibilities that should go along with gun rights and do in other countries with high rates of gun ownership. There's a reason America has a 25 times higher gun homicide rate than any peer nation. 
And we know that's because of easy, unfettered access to guns. And, and why do we have that? Well, something else America has that no other country has, which is an incredibly powerful and wealthy special interest called the gun lobby. Um, and they have worked very hard to enrich gun manufacturers by loosening gun laws and making sure that there are guns for anyone, anywhere, anytime, no questions asked. Um, and so this is not, uh, again, about undoing the Second Amendment. This is simply about responsibility. And we know 90% of Americans support common sense gun laws, like a background check on every gun sale, 89% of gun owners, and only one in 10 even belong to the NRA, and then 87% of Republicans. So hmm. the only place where this is polarizing is is in the U.S. Senate. And so what we have to do is we just have to make sure that our representation is representative of the people that they serve. That's right. And I do think there are some lawmakers who have drunk the Kool-Aid. You know, they really do believe uh, the NRA's disinformation, particularly in in state houses. Um, Some of them are gun extremists. But also there are plenty of lawmakers, particularly Republicans, who are just playing from an old playbook. You know, they deep down inside know that there are ways to prevent deaths from gun violence. They know the right thing to do is to pass stronger gun laws. Uh, but they're still sort of operating from this this 1990s playbook. And, and that's why I always say, you know, our job is to show lawmakers over and over again, if you do the right thing, we'll have your back. If you do the wrong thing, we'll have your job. And when I talked about that vote on Mansion to me, where four of the six senators were Democrats, not a single one of them still has their job. Wow. And in fact, in, in 2008, when Barack Obama was elected, about a quarter of all Democrats in Congress, Democratic lawmakers had A ratings from the NRA. Today, none do. And so this is, you know, again, as I said, it's, it's incremental. It takes a while. But I do believe at some point, Republicans will be on the same side, which is the right side of history. I think this is a perfect pivot over to good news. As you know, we love talking about good news here. And you alluded to this earlier. You have created so much new positive legislation, fought back against lots of negative legislation. But the reality is, I feel like a lot of people still feel like we are losing this battle against gun violence. And it, it just feels like there's it's just so overwhelming and heartbreaking. Why do you think it is that we feel so overwhelmed by the badness around the world of gun violence? And maybe we aren't hearing enough about the good news of the progress that we're making against this important issue. Well, I think people are waiting for this cathartic moment in Congress that that hasn't come. And hmm. it's been about 25 years since Congress passed significant gun safety legislation. But to focus only on Congress is to negate all of the amazing work that has been done on this issue. You know, we have passed background checks now in 21 states We have passed laws that disarm domestic abusers in 29 states. We have passed laws that close what's called the Charleston loophole in 19 states. We've passed red flag laws in 19 states. And truly, we're all only as safe as the closest state with the weakest gun laws. So that is why we need them at a federal level. But we really have been working on this, again, less than a decade, knowing that eventually the momentum we created would point the right president and the right Congress in the right direction. And, and I believe this is that moment. Mm. You know, within the first 100, 100 days of his presidency, Joe Biden has done more than any president in history on this issue. Um, not only is he encouraging Congress to pass background checks and, and other laws that have, or other bills that have passed uh, through the House already, but he is, he has put in place several executive actions that will save lives immediately, whether it's regulating the market for ghost guns, appointing an ATF director, uh, giving over a billion dollars to city gun violence intervention programs. I really feel like we're on the precipice, finally, of major national change. This is so energizing to hear. And in a second, we are going to take a a break and jump into another conversation I got to have with one of your incredible Moms Demand volunteers, Crystal. But before we make that little transition over, I want to ask if there's a particular good news story of, you know, the last few years that you just feel like most energized about, you know, the behind the scenes work that led to that good news story. If you look at the story of Virginia, 
if, if you had told me that in less than eight years, Virginia would be a gun sent state, I wouldn't have believed you back in 2012. In fact, at that point, the U.S. senators like Mark Warner were voting with the NRA. And our volunteers just grew such a robust chapter in the state. And I can remember after the mass shooting in Virginia Beach, Republicans were in charge of the legislature. They called a special se- or the governor called a special session on guns. They adjourned it. Republicans did without any action after just a matter of seconds. And our volunteers decided they were going to double down, that they were going to fight tooth and nail to change the legislature as a repercussion for that vote. And they did. You know, I can remember sitting in, in Richmond, Virginia, the night of the election in 2019, thinking, OK, we'll get lucky if we pa- if we flip one chamber by a few votes. And we flipped both chambers of the General Assembly. Uh, the, one of the top three voting issues was gun safety. And since then, uh, nearly 10 new good gun laws have been have been signed. Wow. Uh, and that includes background checks um, and, and other important life-saving laws. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, but eventually, you know, you will, if you get involved, you will win the race. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are joined by activist Crystal Turner, who is so incredible. I loved getting to talk with her and I know you're going to love hearing from her. We'll be right back. Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Libro FM is the company that lets you support a local bookstore every time you download an audiobook. Here is a run through of how it works. Libro FM members get one audiobook credit per month for $14.99. You can use it on any audiobook you want. When you download audiobooks through Libro FM, you actually get to help support a local bookstore of your choosing, which helps you keep money within your local economy, create local jobs, and make a difference in your community. I wanted to give a quick update on what I'm listening to right now. I'm listening to two books right now. One of them is called Act Your Age by Eve Brown. And it's like this rom-com. It's very cute. And it's not the kind of thing I normally listen to, but I love it. And it is so fun as an audiobook. I highly recommend it. But also I am loving, and this book doesn't come out for another month, but I feel very lucky to have gotten it early. I'm listening to Ashley C. Ford's new memoir. It's called Somebody's Daughter. It is absolutely beautiful. I love hearing her read it in her own voice. And it is brilliantly written. You'll feel connected to her. You'll feel closer to yourself. Wow. Oh my goodness. I love it. It comes out on May 31st, but you can pre-order it on Libra FM now anyway. As a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. All you have to do is visit the website Libro.fm and then use the promo code GOOD. That's just the word GOOD. I feel very cool that we got that as our word GOOD to get started with two audiobooks to help support this show and to support your community. Sounds Good is sponsored by Happily. Sometimes you just want a date night in, but you don't want it to be the same thing as every other night of the week. You want it to be special. Fortunately, Happily created the perfect solution. Happily is the maker of Datebox. It's everything you need for a romantic and fun date night in your home right in a box. They even include a custom playlist and conversation starters for your date. With easy sign up, flexible plans, and fast shipping directly to you, what more could you ask for? Take the pressure off of date night and get your first date box for 50% off. That's half off. Just visit thehappily.co and use the code good, good, good. All one word. One more time. That's thehappily.co and get 50% off with the code good, good, good. Good. 
Crystal, I'm so glad to get to talk with you today. Where are we talking from? Where in the world are you today? The sunny city of Jacksonville, Florida, the largest city in the United States of America. Megan from my team who helps work on Good Eat Good Things lives in Jacksonville and uh, I've heard wonderful things. And also you guys are getting great weather right now. I understand. Yes, we are. We are. We, so I'm hoping I'm sending sun rays um, to everyone who's listening. I could use it. So thank you. And I understand you just got back from an advocacy trip. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. In Ohio. Um, I traveled back to Columbus, Ohio, which um, is the city that I lived in for the past 30 years. Tell me about what you were doing while you were up in Columbus. It was a last minute ideal, but um, on a previous call, someone shared with me that there is actually a international bereaved mother's Mother's Day, which was just this past Sunday. And it is um, annually the Sunday before the traditional Sunday that we celebrate Mother's Day, which is this coming Sunday. And so um, between that and unfortunately all the continued Um, gun violence that is happening here in Jacksonville, um, in Ohio, and just across our country. I thought about how much that trauma continues to re-traumatize mothers each time you hear of another child who's lost a life to gun violence. And so I wanted to do something for the moms there. Um, And so we scheduled some photo shoots for some moms, but more importantly, in the midst of scheduling that, Uh, the Michaela Bryant story um, became the front page of all of the news, which was the 16-year-old young lady um, who lost her life um, in a police-involved shooting, unfortunately due to um, some family altercations that were taking place in the foster home that she resided in. And um, that led me to making some phone calls and emails and text messages to several community leaders and um, community organizations and people that I knew there and said, let's do an evening of prayer. Um, because I know that prayer definitely works. Prayer has the ability to change things. And if you know, as the Bible says, where you can get two or three gathered in a green, then we know all things are possible. And they were all willing to come in. And so um, this past Thursday evening at the City of Grace Church, which is which is on the northeast side, uh, myself and several spiritual faith leaders and community leaders, we all came together. And for an hour, we just simply prayed over um, our bereaved mothers, over our politicians. Our mayor was there with us. We prayed over our mayor. We prayed for justice and we prayed for restoration in our community. And we prayed over the city of Columbus. And the uh, beauty of that evening is, is that uh, we now have several other churches who are picking up the mantle and will be continuing to just simply do an hour of prayer that's open to the public as we just look for ways to connect Um, and work towards healing our city and not just Columbus, but healing all of our cities um, from the continued gun violence that is plaguing many of our communities. I genuinely did not know what your, you know, event that you had gone to was. And to hear that something like this exists is truly incredible. Like what a special thing to be a part of. What, What does it feel like to be a part of a community of, of, other mothers who have experienced something that no mother ever wants to experience. You know, Brandon, that is um, probably a very um, challenging question to ask um, simply because it is a group that you often hear people say you don't want to be a part of. Mm. However, the number of mothers who are now members of a group that is a forever group is growing so much more rapidly than we ever anticipated, but is also a challenging group to be in because to acknowledge you're in this group means you're first acknowledging that something very tragic and unexpected has happened, and that is the loss of a child through gun violence. Um, And to acknowledge that means that we are in a place now where um, the grieving process has already started, but we're acknowledging that this thing is real. So it's kind of a double-edged sword to be a part of this group. Do you mind if uh, we talk a little bit about the loss of your son and daughter? Because I know that that's such a big part of 
the advocacy work that you do today, maybe you could take me back to what happened. Sure. Um, I first have to say that I am a mother of uh, four adult children and a bonus mom to three adult children and a grandmother to a beautifully blended family of 19 grandchildren. Mm, Wow. Um, (laughs) So life's been really interesting for me. Um, However, um, two of those children, my 29-year-old daughter, uh, Janae Harvison at that time, and my 23-year-old son, Donnell McDonald, who continued to still live with us spiritually, were both shot and killed April 1st, 2015 in Columbus, Ohio, um, in an act of domestic violence by my daughter's estranged husband, um, who is now serving a 66 to life and no chance of parole uh, life sentence. Um, And it is because of the loss of my two children that I first became uh, what is now identified as a survivor of gun violence um, and an advocacy to work hard towards making sure the experience that I as a mother and my family has had in the very tragic and sudden loss of two of my children, that another mother coming behind me doesn't have to have that same type of experience. Um, Because we know, based on my experience, there are some things that we have the ability to change in our community. And that is what I'm working towards and fighting for every day is to change the experience. That's incredible that you have turned this grief into something that ensures that fewer people and hopefully no people have to experience this grief. And I'm curious, how quickly did you decide that that was something that you wanted to do? When did you decide to take that pain and turn it into purpose? Well, I didn't decide. It kind of decided for me. Literally, uh, what happened was is... um, People who I know, unfortunately, found themselves in a very same or similar situation where someone they loved had lost their lives to gun violence. And uh, literally, friends, family, um, and even strangers started reaching out to me because our story was such a public story, because my daughter was a very successful daycare owner um, in Columbus, Ohio. She, uh, in a short eight-year period, had went from one 24-hour daycare center to five 24-hour daycare centers and had started a training center where she was um, helping those in the community who wanted to get into the field child, the field of child care, obtain the necessary education and background work needed to get into the field. Um, and she started this literally within months after graduating from Ohio State, summa cum laude, and she just became a successful young lady. So our story was one of those stories that whether we wanted to be or not, um, our family was in the limelight. And I literally said, okay, Crystal, what do you do with this unfortunate 15 minutes of fame that you now have? And with that, and like I said, the calls and the text messages and emails that I began to receive from the community saying, my mom, my sister, my grandmother, my aunt, my friend has lost a child to gun violence and we don't know how to support them. And you just seem to be the most positive person given what you've been through. Can you help us? And that literally began began the advocacy work and the work of giving back to the community um, because listening to their stories and Honestly, Brandon, looking at my situation and as tragic as it may sound to a lot of people, I am very grateful um, because there are some experiences that I have not had to have that other mothers have had to. Um, I was very fortunate that I received um, a lot of support from the community. There are hundreds and thousands of mothers who don't get that support who um, are not aware of the resources that are available to them in the community. And that's pretty much what I've been doing is being able to share what I know um, and give that back to the community. And one of the great um, organizations that I was able to connect with is Moms Demanding Action in Every Town. And um, through them, they have been able to educate me more about um, the legislative side of gun safety and how I can use uh, my very tragic experience to help our legislators 
make laws that will keep uh, my community safe as well as all of the communities across the United States um, based on the experiences that myself and excuse me, so many others have had. And in return with that, I've actually been able to introduce so many other gun survivors to this amazing organization. Um, and we just keep growing and just keep doing some amazing work. And we've been able to make um, very hard, very huge strides over the years. I know that nothing could ever bring back your daughter or your son, but what does it feel like to get to be playing this role in making a difference in, you know, working with legislators, with rallying moms together? What's that experience like for you? I feel like every time I do it, um, I am actually honoring who my children were Mm. and the fact that um, there was a a phrase that was said to me. um, And it was, as many of us do in terms of the universe and whoever or whatever power we choose to serve. Um, There are certain experiences that we all have and we ask that question, why, you know? And for me, it was that the answer given back was, is that their lives were necessary in order for us to bring about change. And so the change for me is just doing exactly what I'm doing is being able to take to our legislators um, an account of what my life has been like in the permanency of my change in losing my two children to gun violence and how there are so many simple measures that we can do, um, such as um, we are support the Self-Defense Restoration Act, um, a landmark effort to repeal uh, Florida's so-called stand your ground law and um, having it being urgent to our lawmakers to give this lifeless bill the healing that hearing that it deserves, um, because we understand that that bill um, is not a bill that we need. Um, And so being able to to just take something that appears to be so simple as that, which is a very large thing, which means, you know, again, we're not fighting and saying, I don't want anyone to own a gun because, you know, a gun has impacted my life. It is simply saying, can we be more safer with the gun? Can we make sure that our gun owners um, know how to properly store their guns, that they are um, getting the necessary training that they need to use a firearm, that if there are any any previous things in their background that suggests that maybe this individual should not own a gun, that we are removing that gun. And and by doing so, um, and not even necessarily, let me change that, not removing the gun, but giving the necessary time to do the investigation to see if this individual should have access to a gun. Mm. That in itself gives us the ability to save a life. And if through my story, I can save one other family from experiencing what I've went through by having this conversation with not only just our lawmakers, but another person, another family, um, our community resource people, then I feel like I've done what I've been called to do in saving a life. What's been the most surprising thing to you as you've been doing advocacy work? While we are probably at the highest point of getting change done where our gun safety laws are, it is still very sometimes discouraging, especially when you are in the face of a lawmaker who seems to not hear your cry and not hear your cry simply because politically it may not make sense for a party when For me, at the end of the day, when you see the residue of blood, the residue of gun hurt and pain from families and individuals, nobody's asking anybody, are you Republican, independent, Democratic? Nobody's asking those questions. All we see is people who are in pain, people who are hurting, people whose lives have forever been changed and understanding Um, or not understanding why elected officials who we've elected in office to support us, to make sure that the communities we live in are safe, 
that it becomes such a challenge for them to just simply do the right thing. That's probably the the biggest and most hurtful thing is to look at um, this year when we look at all of the lives that have been taken over the last year during the pandemic, when we look at um, what has happened at our capital, when we look at the mass shootings that continue to happen, yet our lawmakers still find excuses to justify why they are not on the side of right. That is what hurts. It reminds me of something that Shannon said when uh, she and I were talking, I guess, yesterday. We were talking about this idea that what we really need is just elected officials that represent the will of the people. And right now, yes. the elected officials you know, represent an extreme view that doesn't represent the majority of Americans or the majority of people in their communities. And it is energizing to hear that there are so many people who you know, are willing to put in the work to create that change like yourself, like other moms with Moms Demand. And I am hopeful that we will see that change. And that frustration is only going to make a, make the change more like swift and broad, which is, is heartbreaking that it has to happen that way. But I have no doubt that it will because of your work. And, and with that in mind, I know that the loss of your daughter and son was an act of domestic violence. And I also understand that the pandemic has made the rates and experiences of domestic violence higher than ever. I know that you have a level of expertise on this that I don't have. Can you tell me a little bit more about what we need to know about how the pandemic is affecting gun violence? You know, while... COVID served as um, a way to slow down a lot of the other crimes, uh, crime rates that happened um, or normally would happen. Um, however, during COVID um, in most cities across the country, we've seen an increase in not only shootings, but domestic violence related shootings because you have many more couples and individuals who now found themselves trapped in their homes during the pandemic pandemic uh, with their abusers um, who also had more access to guns during that time. And that's very worrisome when we look at the unprecedented increase in gun violence sales combined with um, the economic stress and the social isolation of COVID, gun violence increased. So we know right now that on average, every month there is uh, approximately 53 women who are shot and killed by an intimate partner. When we look at that larger number, that means that nearly 1 million women across the United States alive today have reported being shot and killed or shot by their intimate partner. So um, COVID has uh, not slowed down that part. Um, we also look at the fact that during COVID, access to guns made it five times more likely that an abusive partner would take the life of a female victim in this. And so, you know, again, the epidemic kind of put uh, a lot of women and men who were already in abusive relationships really put them in more harm's way um, and gave their intimate partners more of an opportunity to actually take their lives than ever before. And when we look at those numbers, we know also that um, predominantly a lot of that came from our Black and Brown uh, communities when we look at how disproportionate the impact of the coronavirus and uh, ongoing violence is happening in those communities as well. Thank you. That's so helpful to understand. And I think it can make us all more aware of the need for us to get involved and to make a difference on this. Another way that if um, someone is looking to get a, involved or you know a mother who has been impacted by gun violence, um, my foundation, which is rerefuse.org, we have a peer support group that is called Mothers in Healing. Um, it is for mothers who have lost children to gun violence, and we meet each month, and you can find that information on mothersinhealings.com um, of our meetings, and um, we invite and we join bereaved mothers to join with us with other mothers who can help each other get through this process of grieving to healing in our new normal lives without our children. Kind of as a final question, I'm curious... What is something that you do feel hopeful about in regards to the progress on gun safety? Where do you feel a sense of hope? 
I am just actually very hopeful and and grateful to have Gunston's champions in our White House. Mm. President Biden and Vice President Harris um, are very big components and champions of doing everything that they can, along with all of our elected officials, to create legislation that just keeps our community safe. Um, and, and that's really all we're asking. And, and I simply can close by just giving you this statement. You don't want to wait until gun violence impacts you and your family to get involved. That is not where you want to start when you have the ability to start right now using your purpose, your gifts and talents that we have all been created with to simply make change now. Um, I waited until it got to me, but I now understand how important, important it is to make sure that because of my experience, I can use it so that another family doesn't have to have my experience. This is not a uh, club, an organization, um, or anything that you want to be a part of. I am grateful for the support and the people I have around me who have really um, changed and impacted my life and, and reminded me of why we all fight and That is simply because, unfortunately, there are so many more people who will come behind us, but we have the ability based on what we know and the data supports that over 93% of the United States citizens want a safe community. We want a safe environment. And so um, I'm hopeful and grateful for that. And again, I would just simply say, um, don't wait until gun violence impacts you and your your family before you get involved. Crystal, thank you so much for your beautiful and important work, the way that you're advocating and the way that you're bringing more people into the fold to be a part of that. And I have no doubt that with people like you on the front lines that we will see change. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. I love Crystal's encouragement for all of us to take action before we need to. When we come back, Shannon is sharing some of the action steps that we can take to join in with the important work that Crystal and moms across the country are taking. Sounds Good is sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapy is amazing. If you've been a longtime listener to Sounds Good, you've heard me talk about going to counseling a lot, and you've heard our guests talk about it even more. The last year has been challenging for a lot of us, and and we've made it through. It's something to celebrate, but we're also going to start wrestling with new things and processing this new journey of what you know the second half of 2021 perhaps looks like. And is more important than ever to be proactive about taking care of ourselves. BetterHelp makes it easy to get matched with your own licensed professional therapist. And all you have to do is answer a few questions and they'll get you matched and ready to start in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions from anywhere in the world. BetterHelp and I guess and I want to help you start living a happier life today. Just visit betterhelp.com slash good and join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. BetterHelp is offering a special offer for Sounds Good listeners. You get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash good. That's betterhelp.com slash good. All right, Shannon, I am feeling hopeful. Again, I'm feeling encouraged. I'm feeling like it is perhaps truly possible to create change and that we've seen that over the last several years, your community has created change. And now I'm recognizing, oh my gosh, I want to be a part of this. So how do I and others who feel this way, how do we get involved? How do we join in the work that you're doing? First of all, you can text the word READY to 64433. 
And, you know, Moms Demand Action isn't just moms. It's not just women. It's mothers and others. Uh, We have grown to just be one of the largest organizations in the country uh, that's doing grassroots work. and, And we welcome all caring Americans. And we also have Students Demand Action now. So if you, again, text the word READY to 64433, uh, a volunteer will call and plug you in uh, to the work you're passionate about, where you live. We also have Facebook pages uh, for states and a a national page. We also have uh, our Twitter handle is at at Moms Demand. We have at Students Demand as well. And then we're on Instagram. You can kind of find us on, on any social media platform that you hang out on. Amazing. This is so perfect and so practical and actionable. Shannon, thank you just once again for the incredible work that you do and for inviting us all to be a part of it. Thank you so much. That's Shannon Watts, founder of Moms Demand Action and Crystal Turner, activist and founder of Mothers in Healing. You can learn more about Moms Demand Action at momsdemandaction.org and Mothers in Healing at mothersinhealing.com. The easiest way to get started with Moms Demand Action in your community is to just text the word READY to 64433. You can also visit Moms Demand Action's national or state-specific Facebook pages or follow at Moms Demand on Twitter and Instagram. If you're interested into diving into some more conversations about gun violence and grief and maybe even a sense of hope, we've got two older episodes from a few years ago that you might appreciate. The first is with Joshua Dubois, who was President Obama's faith advisor. He shared the stories of being in the room with President Obama when the president was meeting with the parents who lost their children at Sandy Hook. And the second episode was with Bonnie Kate and Max Zogby. Bonnie Kate was injured in the shooting at the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and shared the story of her recovery and also the love story that intertwined with that experience. You can find both of those episodes by just scrolling back through Sounds Good episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good news paper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at Sound On soundoff.com. Please make sure to hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts so that you can get new episodes of Sounds Good delivered to your phone each Monday while you sleep. If you have a favorite episode of the show, share it on your Instagram stories to share the word about celebrating good news and taking good action. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and take one tangible action to prevent gun violence. And we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?